Hello YouTubers, this is a new session where we get to start talking about, you know, implementing a, a software, simple software system written in Python according to the standard. Python is one of the oldest languages that is being used today along with C and C++ and all these other uh, different languages. Uh, Python showed up, uh, you know, or was released in the 1991, uh, I think, I think the 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 gentleman that created his name is Guido Van Busum or something like that. He's he's a, a software scientist, an amazing guy that got the uh, free software award from uh, from the Free Software Foundation by uh, Richard Matthew Stolman. Uh, Python is is a very very interesting and unique story as a language as a as a community as a whole uh, because at some point in time you know while while it being super adapted you know it runs on you know cross platform runs on any operating system and stuff like that you know there has been a little bit of you know uh, issues within the community. Uh, of Python and the investment of the maturity of the language, you know, uh, uh, this is why when you, when you try to use Python, you'll always be facing the question of, do I use uh, Python 2 or Python 3.11, right? I think 2.7 or 3.11, right? And um, you know, the reason for that is, is that there's, there has been a lot of complex libraries and a lot of uh, modules that were written in that language in uh, version 2 that weren't properly ported or not ported at all to uh, version 3, right? Uh, but more importantly than this, there was a a, a little bit of, uh, you know, kind of a, a slowdown with the community of Python. They didn't really, you know, adapt as fast as they could. Like, you know, you see the PHP community folks said, you know, we're going to upgrade. We're going to be backwards compatible. Python 3 is not backward, backwards compatible. And that's why you end up with this situation where you have to two different versions of a language are still alive. If you do just a quick search, you'll hear everybody saying, oh, Python 2 is going away. But that's what people have been saying for years and it's still around and people are still using it, especially for existing really, really complex big systems and stuff like that. So, you know, what is the standard? If you reach this video, right, and this is the first time you come to this channel, watch this video, you know, uh, uh, I'm going to show you, you know, how we architect a software in general and how we take this architecture and basically materialize it and implement it in a Python program. So a while back, I introduced the world to something called the standard, the engineering standard, which runs on a theory called the tri-nature theory of everything, which basically dictates that everything out there in the universe, any system, no matter what this system is, is comprised of three things. It has dependency, right, to survive. It has its purpose, and it has its exposure layer, right? It has three layers, and each one of these layers are connected with each other in that particular order. So your exposure layer doesn't talk to your dependency. It has to go through your purpose within that system. An example of that is you, you know, the person that's watching this video right now. You are a bio system, right? You have dependencies. You need to eat food. You have purposes. Maybe you like to write software. And uh, you have an exposure, you know, way to expose and connect with the world through your words, through your, you know, social media interactions. This is all exposure layer. This is how you allow the world to interact with you and you interact back with that world. You can the, you can see that very clearly if you're building a simple RESTful API. So let's say you have an API in here. Your API maybe has a controller. The controller is like the, the, the little class or the little component that has the endpoints. And then you have a service which what holds your business logic. And then you have brokers that basically connect your external dependencies. You'll see you're always abstracting away your dependencies as much as you can. So you don't have to have a tight coupling or tight dependency between your business logic and the outside world. And then you have your exposure layer which only talks to your purpose layer or your service layer so assume that you have a database sitting in here you know the database assume the database is SQL or something like that your business logic should not know you know at all what this uh, technology is or have any you know tight coupling with it in any way shape shape or form the standard is a book big book it's open source so super high uh, highly recommend that you go and take a look you know, if you type in the standard, I'm going to put the uh, link in the in the description uh, of this video, just so you know, it's open source, you know, you have there's a lot of topics in it. It's also translated in different languages, you'll see a lot of different languages, there's a lot of efforts, you know, to translate the standard, but also you'll see the standard, uh, you know, I've been kind of the, the a part of this video is to allow, you know, people to see what the standard would look like if it's implemented in Java or Kotlin or, or Go or whatever other programming languages that are out there, you get to see 
you know what it looks like and the beauty about the standard is that you get to like once you understand the theory it doesn't take you long to understand how a certain system works so you don't have to actually bend your you know brain backwards just to understand how a certain system works no matter how complex the system is no matter how foreign you may be to the language that this system has been written in so okay so we got all that cool stuff out of the way uh, I'm going. I'm going to be using a, a, a IntelliJ uh, version uh, to write Python software. I think it's called what's it called? It's called PyCharm. PyCharm. PyCharm is basically one of these different. You know, you can do it in VS Code. You can do it in so many different uh, IDEs. I think this one is all right. I've been using it mainly, you know, since the beginning of this series. So it's probably a great idea to you know do something like that so what are we gonna implement today you know I'm basically going to go and create a a phantom uh, student student storage broker right so this is a storage broker that basically takes in a student model we're not really gonna connect it to a database or anything the idea here is to kinda show you a test driven you know implementation for the services itself and then you have a student service like this and maybe we have like a main class or something like that something that basically interacts with the service it doesn't matter right and then we're gonna test drive this so we're basically gonna mock this guy and basically pass in parameters uh, to this to this service and see if these parameters actually work the way the way it's expected I'm, I'm not gonna lie to you it took me a while just to wrap my head around you know because I am I am a dotnet c-sharp guy for a very long time so when I step outside of that zone and I advise you to always step out that comfort zone just to see what's out there in the world and learn ideas and stuff like that uh, Python is quite interesting and I'm gonna talk about some you know interesting concepts that I've seen in the language that's gonna make you also go like huh why is it like that and why is it implemented like that and all that so anyway I'm gonna create two di directories in here there's a source directory and I'm gonna go and create another directory and I'm gonna call it tests so I have these two directories and then I'm gonna move that main guy inside the uh, source directory so here's our source and then we're just gonna start simple right we're gonna go and say here is a a a directory I'm gonna call it models dot students right so it's like name spacing kind of thing if you're a dotnet guy and then I'm gonna go and create a a Python file that's a student and then I'm gonna define a, a class I'm gonna call it student here we go and this student has a, a let's say an ID right so ID which is int you know and its value is none something like that and we also want a name which is a string I think I think this guy goes here a name which is string right equals none as well none is like sort of the equivalent of null like it there's no value there right and um, uh, one of the things that people like about Python 3 is that it's more typed than Python 2 so they really love the fact that you can have types and stuff like that okay so I have this student let's go create another directory I'm gonna call it storages dot students sorry brokers dot storages like that so I'm creating my storage broker in here I'm creating a new Python file I'm gonna call it storage broker something interesting for you that you will notice in here Python doesn't really understand interfaces like it doesn't have the idea of interfaces you know they have the duck typing idea which is if you pass in something in there and this something is uh, you know whatchamacallit if this something has this method in it then we're good to go but you can actually specify a specific type that has to be passed in there but you can also leave it open so it seems like a, very, a little bit forgivable language this is why um, uh, a lot of people say hey if you're beginning to learn software engineering it's great that you start with Python because if you've been doing this for 20 something years like like I did you know you're gonna start noticing things that will make you go hmm why is it done like that that's very interesting you know and also don't don't take my naming convention too seriously you know I have a very specific way of doing naming conventions uh, you know if, follow Python naming conventions I'm only using trying to trying to show you what it's like to implement a standard compliant Python program with 30 minutes of learning about the language itself okay so here's a storage broker like this and then I'm gonna go and say you know my storage broker has a function called insert I'm gonna try to stay true to their naming conventions as much as I can and then there's a student and you pass in student that's of this type like this ah 
see it doesn't like directory you want to create a package and I'm pretty sure there is a way here that you can just turn it into package maybe I'm gonna call this source root for 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 better or worse and then I'm gonna call this test a test source root I like the different colors but also it doesn't know about the student because let me go and create a a, a a Python package and I'm gonna call it models.students like this right and then I'm gonna take that student model in here watch this weird init that pi kind of thing I think it's just a an instantiation of a class or something like that it's, it's very interesting but once I do something like this and I'm pretty sure that there's a way that you can uh, definitely name the files you know but here we are you know so I'm gonna import the student so this is at least this part is going fine right I can import you know a package for students and I can get this particular type I can do like this and I say hey this is supposed to return a student and then actually just return the student because I'm not really gonna talk to an actual database okay what is this guy complaining about format the file and then it wants me to make this static, which I'm not going to do because I, I actually want it to look like that. Funny thing, though, if you want to make a function static like this, you have to do something like that, which I'm not I'm not super fan of. I don't like I want it to be a, an extension of the expression, not an additional or an afterthought. Like every time you see something like this, that's an afterthought, right? That's the thing that's going and saying, hey, I can't express it nicely in a language. So I'm going to go and say, oh, let me add this additional thing. Uh, if you watch any of my previous videos, you'll see me heavily criticizing this kind of pattern. Uh, it can be necessary. It can be the only option or the best option at a point in time. But, you know, it still kind of begs the question, can we not uh, uh, make, you know, uh, mirroring our thoughts through a programming language something a little bit better than doing something like that? Anyway, I'm pretty sure the Java folks will be you know a little bit concerned that I'm making these comments but this is just what I think this is my personal thoughts okay so we have the brokers we have storage brokers no interfaces fine uh, let's go and create a another package and I'm gonna call it services dot students like this and then inside this guy I'm gonna create a a new class called student service okay and this student service now has it needs a constructor right how do constructors look like in Python you have to do this underscore underscore init underscore underscore and self is supposedly a reference to the instance of this type or this class that you're in what do I think about this yeah that's terrible I that's not a, that's not an expression that I want to look at right it's quite a, a, a unnatural that's the best I could say and natural to look at something like this it doesn't have a cohesion with the with the flow of things that you're trying to express it, it seems to be like a like a a really really try hard way of you know basically saying I want a unique method you know that you know immediately that it's the inst the, in the instantiator or the initializer of of the language but, get, but then again 1991 right this is language it's th this language appeared even before Java right so a, a whole lot of the ideas that uh, James Gosling came up with you know came up later as an afterthought right okay so I want a storage broker I want it to be actually of type storage broker it doesn't know what storage broker is and uh, let's fix that control did I put my uh, I put my storage brokers in a non package okay so uh, brokers oops brokers dot storages and let me take all of this and let me go into this package in here and let me slap that in there and then delete this because we don't need it anymore all right great great so this is my storage broker and then if I go back to my service now it knows what this storage broker is because now it's a package it's a Python package something else that's very interesting about this apparently you can have your constructor return something specific in this case here I'm saying none like I'm saying I don't I don't expect you to do anything I'm just gonna you know pass in the object to you you know and just initialize this object for me very interesting because when we go instantiate the service you're still gonna get an instance back how does it work it's it's 
it I think the instance itself is instantiated doesn't care about the reference something else is going on there that I'm still trying to kind of <laughs> make sense of anyway so what does this storage broker do so I'm gonna go and say self dot storage broker and by the way this is oh sorry this naming convention here is not correct storage broker yeah storage broker equals whatever storage broker coming from the outside world okay where does this storage broker came from like ideally if you're in c-sharp you'd say oh i want to define something here called storage broker and give it the default value or something like that nope in here you just get to add it on the fly and it will try to understand what's going on automatically okay so you can see a little bit of JavaScript -y in it, right? A little bit forgiveness. It's like, oh, don't worry about instantiating things. Just name things out, and we'll try to duct tape it and figure it out on the fly, right? And maybe that's why it's appealing to some people that the language is interesting and all that. By the way, you don't have to use this. Like, you could just leave this alone like that, and that would be also fine. But I like the thin arrow kind of expression, so why not? Let's put it in there. Also, forget about scopes. There's no squigglies. So it's all tab make sure you're under which is also a big a big a big problem for me you know I need to see things scoped I need them to see in a in a specific way so that's that's a little problem okay here's a function and this function will take a student as an input parameter I don't think we have a reference to student in here so I'm gonna go and hold that package there you go this is supposed to return a student you also don't have to do this but this time I'm gonna raise in here and say not implemented exception or not implemented error or something like that so this is me basically test actually truly test driving this I'm basically going and saying hey I have a dependency and I need to inject this dependency and I need to test drive that we uh, implemented the right format or the right a uh, 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 method call you know and we passed in the right parameter to get that method going okay so so far so good so this is your imports this is your student service it's all great let's go to uh, our test right so under our test I'm gonna go here and create you know a new directory I'm gonna say services dot students since we're not pulling any packages in here really so I think it might be okay and then I can select Python unit tests right so I'm gonna do this and then I'm gonna go and say uh, uh, what what do I want to name this this is gonna be uh, a student service tests okay so it comes in with this nice and sweet I have to give it to the uh, uh, to the, to the uh, people that you know working on the templates and the IDE and all that it's very very simple and easy to kind of get up and going with uh, with Python's testing right one problem that I'm seeing that one of the things that I saw in go as well you have to start your unit test uh, method with test if you take test out like this it's not a test anymore that's a problem I'd rather have a thing in here that says tests as much as I hate this rather than you know having the uh, the, the framework saying I don't understand what a test method is unless you say test underscore like that that's that's really weird okay so if you're not familiar with the standard and how we do things we break things into given and this is not something I invented this is something very famous you'll see people say assert arrange you know something like that action arrange something like that I think given when then is much easier to remember and much uh, much simpler to remember and easier to work with okay okay so I have my test in here why is this guy tripping let's see what's the problem here uh... Just trying to put a comment, dude. That's all. What is this? Let's see. Uh, run. Nothing to show. Cannot get importable name of student service test. Is it a Python file? In project. It is a Python file, right? I think. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, I'm running the thing. Yeah, I guess it doesn't care. It's just a indent expected. Indent expected? Like this? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, there you go with the indentation and stuff. Anyway, so uh, let's bring this down and let's create our... First First of all, I'm going to create our input student. 
right? And this input student is just going to be a student model like this. We need to pull the dependency, so that's my student. And then uh, maybe give that, uh, so I have input student, I have uh, inserted student, so that's the student that we inserted in the database, right? So I'm going to go here and say that's the same as input student. I also have expected 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 student which comes in from insert student I do this because the naming conventions when we use these variables you'll see how important it is it'll be like you're using the same variables and you're just giving them different names but that's super important when you're setting up your tests because it makes the readability of your code much much easier and it's basically telling you the whole story it's being we have an input student we're gonna insert that student and then we expect that student to match whatever we inserted in there okay let's let's mock let's mock our storage broker right so I have a storage broker mock equals right and then there's something called magic mock right and this magic mock basically will go and say hey you know whatever you're you're trying to to mock in here I'm gonna take care of it for you I think you have to pass storage broker to it like this yeah or something like that or actually let's instantiate this as a storage broker and then you're gonna go and say storage broker mock dot insert student like this equals magic mock and then return value I think equals inserted student right so that's your statement here is one thing I really really don't like about Python if you want to take a new line it'll do this to you do you see that little a slash in there that's that just that's just sad you know like I should be able to have my system written in a way but again it's all tab based it doesn't know there's no scopes that's why it's a problem right because you don't have scopes so now when you're taking a new line is that a scope or is that a new line and now things start to get really weird and complicated so that's another thing you know uh, not super appreciating about the language but also we have a student service which is is my student service that wants to I'll tell you a funny story in a second so this is storage broker mock that's it okay great or maybe it's happening right now you see how in here it's saying storage broker mock and then if you click on this uh, why what is it complaining about let's see this guy here does it need to be told student service does this help let's see why is it mad and why is this guy mad too let's see here ignore errors like these rename the element nope not gonna do either of that uh, so ignore remove statement remove the element no I'm not gonna do any of that yeah it's, it's just tripping like the the ID itself is tripping I don't know what it's up to but it's definitely tripping. Okay. Okay, so I have a student service. I passed in my mocked in dependency in here. I think it wants this guy to be like this. Oh my god. Okay, great. I am tripping. It's my fault. Okay. What do we do now? We need to go make that call, right? So we need to go and say actual student equals, right? And then we're gonna go and say student service dot add student, and then we're gonna pass in that input student like this. See how the naming convention here is super important and super helpful because now when you go and do these things, ah, ah. So now when you go and do these things, you can see that, oh, there's actual student, there's inserted student, and there will be expected student that we're going to use in a second. How do we do expected student? You go and say self, which is like this, assert equal, and then you want actual student to, to be equivalent to expected student. Like that. See? That's pretty cool, right? Also, we want to we want to go and say that my storage broker mock dot insert student that calls assert called once assert called once with where is it? Uh, called once with there it is. So this is us basically testing and saying I want to assert that this mock that we've written has been called once with this input student that's your test so that's basically us going and saying here's an input here's my dependency here's my service 
is me mocking the behavior. So it doesn't matter really what it's what it's returning because whatever I'm pa I'm gonna pass in here is what's gonna be returned, and regardless. So it's not really calling the real database, right? So you're basically going in here and saying my my storage broker mock. I'm gonna mock that guy. That guy is already fake right or at least the method that's inside of it is fake right it'll be interesting about the instantiation like as we build more complex systems maybe the standard universal series will be more about you know let's take these guys all the way right let's build an api endpoint in scala and java and all these different languages just to show people what it's like including the validations and exception handling and all that cool stuff okay let's run this test so our hypothesis is that this test should should really fail right let's see if that's true there you go what's it say it says i have an error and the error is raise exception failed to import module not found i i really highly doubt that these are the errors that we want let's see what's happening here make failed import test uh ch -ch 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 errors one Trace back most recent goal. Yeah, because not not every failure is a good failure, right? So it could be, it's not necessarily the run Python tests. Yeah, so there's that. Let's see if we implement it, what happens? If I just go and implement that guy, what happens? Also, these are just like empty files. That I don't know why why the ID is creating them honestly like all of these empty files on the side don't care about these init pi uh, files let me delete that too okay so here's my storage broker and then I have my model and I have my service okay let's implement the service then I'm gonna go here and say return self dot storage broker dot insert student and here's your student parameter okay now if I run the test would this be happy yeah, I highly doubt it. See, there's something else going on here. Student service test. What if I created this as a... Let's see here. So I have my unit test. I have everything in here. Uh, expected student, actual student. What kind of options does this guy reformat the file? Is that what it is? It's not just not happy about some indentation. It could be it. You never know. Like you know, the indentation part is is a little problematic. Is that really what it is? That would be hilarious. Uh, no module named student service tests in line. Okay. Ah. Uh, We'll fix this now let's see so I know for a fact that all of this like this file is good but we need to kind of confirm I'll just call it test uh, student service test maybe I forgot something like this if I run this, still the same problem. I can't get an importable name for a student service. Is it Python file in the project? Is it a Python file in project? Yeah, it is a Python file in project. Uh, bookmarks, refactor. I wonder if I put the tests, let's just see, for for funsies, because I haven't done this, uh, let's see, where is the other project that I created for this, this could, this could be it. So this is the other project. What's the difference here? So there's this guy, and then there's this guy here. So what's the difference here? Uh, oh, I created this. Yeah, I didn't do this colorful thingy, and I don't think it matters honestly. But you know, I'll just remove it just just to see what comes. Unmark and unmark this. I don't think it really does anything, but eh, worth a shot. Let's see what it does. 
failed to import. So there is that. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Oh, sorry. This is this is actually the. Yeah, this is actually the the project that's not running. Let's try the one that is that is running. Yeah, this one here works. So what's the difference? Um, student service tests. Uh, we have our source. We have our tests. And then we have a bunch of services that are put in place. And we have this guy in here. I don't. I don't really see much difference between the two. Oh, I see these in here. Okay, let's see what this is. Storage broker. Actually, let me do this. Let me take all of these out and let me pull these dependencies again. This might be it. This might be the reason. Let's do this. Here's this. Bring this guy in. Magic mock. Okay, I pulled all of these guys in. Let's see if that does anything for us. Can't get an importable name. Can't get an importable name. Okay. So we're going to debug this together, I guess. So line test failure. It's taking me to the actual... Uh, yeah, traceable failed to import test module services. Why is that? Why it doesn't like it? Services.students. What if I move this guy completely out? So I move this file completely out. Let's see if that helps in anything. Uh, okay. I take these out. I pull them back in. Yeah, just too much magic going on. Like, it's not the most intuitive. But then again, this is like 30 minutes learning Python, so. Most recent call. But there is, yeah, module not found error, module models. Okay, models. Okay, so it's saying model students. This is models. This is student, and this is a student model. Oh, I have the errors in here. Did I move things around? Is that why? Let's see. Yeah, it's super weird. Like, maybe because I deleted some of these files, so it kind of freaked out. Yeah, see, this is gone. I think that's why. This is the reason why right here. Okay, here we go. So this is good, 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 good. And then there's just a, a random. So let's delete this file completely. Yeah, I think something happened with the packages. That's definitely what. Yeah, there you go. We have a passing test right there. Right. OK, so what does that mean? We well, figured it out. So let, let's move this inside that folder because it really needs to be there. And then I think if I move this inside that folder, do I have to re-export? <laughs> yeah, there it is. That's the problem there. I just moved things around. And now it doesn't know because it's doing some uh, uncontrollable or, or invisible magic. It's like it has its own namespace that's going on in the file itself that you don't see. And now you have to re-import everything, which is not, not the best thing to do, honestly. I, I think something is up with that. I'm not sure. Anyway, if I run this, uh, <laughs> does it mess up everyone again? Let's see. Or is it really the f is it really the file itself, the file name itself that's problematic? So it's saying I uh, cannot get importable name for student service tests dot pi. Huh. What if I refactor? Let's see, services like that. What happens? It runs. So I guess it's the name. That's that's really weird because the the project that worked 
at services.students right here. So why is that any different? Maybe I put in a character in there uh, unintentionally that caused this. Let's see, services.students. Now I'm curious and I really want to find out what's going on. Yeah, see, it's still running. That's weird. Something in the folder, I guess, that wasn't quite right. But what I really want to do here is that, see, even if I go and raise, I, I really want to test their um, uh, their mocking uh, system. So the original method will not actually return anything. It's going to raise not implemented exception. Does that mean that my test fails? Let's find out. No, it doesn't. So it's actually mocking. So they have this um, uh, uh, mock mock magic that does this for us. Anyway, that's that's pretty much the you know the idea of it. Let me zoom out a little bit just so you can see what's happening. But this is basically one tiny story here that you're basically able to you know uh, create an object, you know create your dependency, use dependency injection, uh, break down your test into setup, run, and then assert. Um, a little bit of fight with packages and file names and all that. If you something else that I really don't don't really like too much if you go and try to change file names it makes your import look really weird so I'm going to show you here an example if you go into the storage broker and you basically go into refactor and you say I want this to be storage broker uh, storage broker like this right and if I hit this now your storage broker that you're actually trying to use is going to be funny looking look what look what it's going to look like if I do alt enter and do this now it's including this file name as part of your namespace but I don't want the file name in there right like what if I don't want the file name to be part of this I just want to go and say in this package from source brokers storages give me whatever right it should so what if I do like star like this or underscore no <laughs> Anyway, yeah, so this is why I didn't name these files, because it, it made it look weird to actually look at um, uh, the imports. And now it's super tied up with the file name, which is, I guess it's not a terrible thing. It's just quite weird to, to see what that looks like. And if you look at the, um, <laughs> if you look at the, uh the 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 system files that we're looking at like the, the the libraries that we're working with like mock and all that they have the file here named mock itself so does that mean this is your file name so you are in a folder called unit test and then this is the file name interesting interesting so that could be called like students broker or something like that or something to that effect. I, I don't expect Python to have like the concept of partial classes and whatnot, but that's that's basically the the essence of it. Anyway, I'm gonna put this back to um, to underscore underscore init right and I don't need that part here anymore. So everything should probably work okay. Let's run this one more time. Great. Okay, so here's a standard compliant system in Python. Let's go share that on GitHub. Standard Python. And I'm going to share this file here. Add account, log in with GitHub. Should be already logged in. Authorized to GitHub. Continue. Done, done. And then we're back here. Come on. Here we go, and then uh, share. Here we go, and then we don't want the IntelliJ stuff, so just the source and the tests, and everything else should be should be kosher. Okay, here we go. Here you go. So that's standard Python. I'm also making it part of our kind of you know uh, standard universal to see how easy would it be to go and basically add in a, a build package. So if I want, so this will be create a test, create and test Python package, multiple Python versions. Okay, let's do this. So I'm also testing GitHub itself just to see 
how fast would it be that I create an action and kick off this action and see what I have. So if I refresh this, it should kick off some action. It works great with some languages. It doesn't really play along with some others. It really depends on the ease of use, right? Like, here you go. So set up Python 3.1. And then this is basically saying uh, version 3.1 with uh, architecture x64 not found. Well, was not found in the local cache. And then it didn't know what to do with it. And then it kind of hang up and it basically called it done. Yeah, you know, I guess it needs a little bit more setup, you know, but uh, overall, yep, we have we have a standard compliant Python. Um, there's there's a lot to, you know, learn from. And, and just for the people watching, a big part of what I'm doing here is to kind of show you truly what it's like to just jump right into the language just see that just study how like literally with most of this standard universal series is that i go and say how do i do a class how do i do dependency injection what's your testing framework done and if you can figure these things out and how do you raise an exception i guess so once you figure out these you know three or four things maybe five things that's all you're gonna need to do to kind of build a properly tested system and i'm telling you this like you can go to some of the most complex systems or the biggest enterprise systems all the way down to the smallest systems it doesn't matter what you're building as long as you have this try nature of everything theory and you're trying to implement a program according to that theory like the language itself you'll you'll start realizing that the language itself is just a tool it doesn't mean anything unless you kind of mirror your thoughts and express yourself you know through the language and see how it works you know, if you're a, a, a super uh, diehard Python fan, I hope you had a little bit of a chuckle and laughs about my confusion here. And if you are new to Python, I hope this kind of helps you kind of start looking into it if it's something that you want to chase. And if you're a, a person that I've been writing uh, standard compliant systems or interested in any way, shape, or form in the standard, I hope that kind of gives you an insight of how you can understand a program written in a language that you've never seen before, you know, and you still can figure out actually what's going on just by it following following the engineering standard. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, you know, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, please feel free to drop a comment in the comment section, and I'll see you in another video with a new programming language. Take care, bye.